Our scripture this morning is taken from Genesis 22, verses 1 through 19. I invite you to stand as you're able for the reading of God's word. Genesis 22, 1 through 19. Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son. Yes, Isaac, whom you love so much. And go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. The next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there, and then we will come right back. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders, while he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them walked on together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. We have the fire and the wood, the boy said, but where is the sheep for the, off- the burnt offering? God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son, Abraham answered. And they both walked on together. When they arrived at the place where Abraham had told him to go, Abraham, where God had told him to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. Then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. Abraham named the place Yahweh will provide. To this day, people still use that name as a proverb. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called again to Abraham from heaven. This is what the Lord says. Because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants number like the star. Your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies, and through your descendants all the nations of the earth will be blessed, all because you have obeyed me. Then they returned to the servants and traveled back to Beersheba, where Abraham continued to live. This ends the reading. You may be seated. Well, good morning. My name is Lynn Conver, husband of Pastor Jeanette Conver, whom you've already had the great privilege of meeting. I'm a lucky man. We've been members of Kent Covenant for almost 23 years, Our four adult children, now scattered across the globe, all grew up here. We also have a nine-month-old, incredibly handsome and very intelligent grandson who, unfortunately, is not growing up here, but we're still praying about that. As members of Wycliffe Bible Translators, Jeanette and I moved to Kent in 1991 to start a language project for a group of Southeast Asian refugees living in Seattle. For the past 10 years or so, we've been involved in a number of ways supporting the ongoing work of Bible translation for the hundreds of millions of people around the world still without access to God's Word in a language they can understand. This month, Pastor Keith has been taking his annual study leave, and as has been mentioned, he will be back in the pulpit with us next Sunday, and we're looking forward to that. He's actually in California this weekend celebrating the graduation of his daughter Marissa from Azusa Pacific University. And those of us that know Marissa are excited about that and proud of that. And we celebrate with their family. 
In his absence this month, different ones of us have taken turns examining stories from the life of Abraham, patriarch of the Jewish nation. We have looked at Abraham's life of faith as the Lord called him to leave his home and travel to a distant land, an unknown land, and then later to wait and trust God to give him a son even when he and his wife Sarah were very old. I think Pastor Keith asked everybody he could think of to preach for him this Sunday, and nobody else was available, and so he finally turned to me, but I'm very glad to be here. It doesn't bother me if I wasn't plan A. Um, (laughs) This morning, we're going to be considering what I think is clearly the biggest test that Abraham faced. Before we begin, however, let's pray and ask the Lord to be with us as we give attention to his word. We hunger to hear your voice, Lord. Please send your word. May it carry us along in your spirit, and may you use it to make us more like Christ. Help us tune out the noise of the world and all its distractions. Help us know that you are guiding and protecting us. We love you, Lord, and we need you. We ask these things in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. If you grew up going to Sunday school as a kid, like I did, or if you've at least been attending church for a few years, you're likely familiar with the story that we're looking at this morning. If this episode from the life of Abraham is new to you, though, you may actually find it pretty disturbing. For the record, I agree with you. I think it's very disturbing on several levels. I have a lot of questions about it, more questions than I could possibly answer this morning. One of the more obvious questions is, why did God give Abraham such a horrible command, even if he didn't mean it, or perhaps especially if he didn't mean it? I don't think there's a simple answer to that. Today we want to think a bit about what the Bible says about testing. Now let me be very clear This story is an extreme example of testing. It's way over at the end of the scale, and most of the things that we want to, most of the truth that we find in Scripture about testing is perhaps stretched when we get to this story. So I'm kind of bouncing back and forth between talking about this story and talking about testing in general. And not everything that I say about testing applies as well to this story, because, as I said, this story is disturbing. Isaac was the child of promise. The Lord had promised to bless not only his parents, but the whole world through him. Yet now, Abraham is instructed to take his son and sacrifice him as a burnt offering. The threefold, increasingly intimate reference in verse 2, your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love, reinforces the intensity of what God is asking. Now, some of you don't know this, but Jeanette and I have our own son, Isaac. He's the oldest of our four children. So I find that I'm always particularly drawn into this story. And as a dad, I can't imagine receiving more horrifying instructions. It should be noted that in the ancient world, child sacrifice was not unusual as an element in pagan worship. The Ammonites, for example, that we read about in the Old Testament, sacrificed children to their god, Molech. Obviously, they didn't sacrifice all their children. This request or command from the Lord wouldn't have been as shocking to Abraham as it is to us, but it still must have been horrific. He and Sarah had waited 25 years for this promised child. How could God take back this wonderful answer to their prayers? Now let's not kid ourselves. This story is infamous. It troubles folks who don't even go to church. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if this story is the reason that some of them don't go to church. 
Pastor Dan told me about a friend of his here in the area who doesn't claim to be a believer, but with whom he sometimes has conversations about the Bible, which is cool. And that friend told Dan, she thought that story about God telling the guy he had to kill his own son was horrible. Yeah, everything turns out okay in the end, but it's still emotional abuse of the highest order. What kind of God treats his devoted followers like that? Certainly not a loving God, or so many people might suggest. Another question I have is, how do we interpret the complete absence of comment here about Abraham's emotions during these events. It's really weird when you think about it. Bible stories often, and I would say even usually, include some information about how the participants in the story feel about what's happening. Moses, for example, was angry in Exodus 16, Leviticus 10, Numbers 16, and a whole lot of other places. Saul was angry in 1 Samuel 11 under the express inspiration of the Spirit of God, as it turns out, which is kind of interesting. David was angry in 1 Chronicles 13, and even Jesus got angry in Mark 10 when the disciples prevented the children from getting near him, and again in John 11 when he saw the friends of Lazarus mourning their deceased friend. Hannah was discouraged in 1 Samuel 1, as were the people of Israel in Exodus 6 and the writer of Psalm 42. And judging by how frequently in the scriptures people are instructed to not be afraid, there are clearly abundant examples of people being afraid. Yet there's no indication at all here that Abraham was angry or discouraged or afraid about what was taking place. And Sarah isn't even mentioned. What's up with that? Now, I know we can't build an argument from silence about the response these events would have generated. But think about this. After Abraham received this terrible instruction in verse 2, verse 3 just says that he got up early the next morning and began to make preparations to go. Now, some people interpret this to mean that since his mind was made up, he got up early to get started on what he determined to do. I don't know. Personally, I think it makes at least as much sense to think that after tossing and turning all night, he finally gave up trying to sleep, and that's the reason why he got up early. It's interesting that the New Testament gives us more information about these events, especially in the book of Hebrews, where we read in chapter 11, it was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. Now, this is helpful. But now I'm wondering, how is it that the writer of Hebrews knows that this was what was going on in Abraham's mind? It doesn't say anything in Genesis 22 about him believing Isaac would be brought back to life. Yes, in verse 5, when he left his servants with the donkey, he does say, the boy and I will travel a little farther, we will worship there, and then we will come right back. And that could mean that he trusted that Isaac would somehow survive. But it could also just mean that he was not giving all the information to his servants because he didn't want them to prevent him carrying out this terrible plan. In any event, I think it's safe to say Abraham had never actually witnessed God raise someone from the dead. Questions, questions. And I said I have more of them than I have answers. In preparing for this morning, I learned that the specific language of the text points to a recognition by God. He knows that he's asking Abraham to do something very difficult. I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but in verse 2, there's apparently a little word, not, it's actually even less than a word, it's just a little particle of a word, that apparently is normally translated as please or 
I beg you. And it, it doesn't sound right in this context for the Lord to say, take, please, your son, or take, I beg you, your son. But that would actually be a, a, an accurate, literal translation of the verse. One commentary noted that although this not occurs 60 times in Genesis alone, it's used only five times in the whole Bible where God is speaking to someone. And in each of those instances, God is asking the individual to do something staggering, something that defies rational explanation or understanding. So the choice of words gives strong evidence that God understood he was making a terrible request. Now I want to take a short detour to point out a more optimistic aspect of this, of this episode, namely the many ways in which it gives a preview of the story of Jesus. And this is really kind of cool. There are an amazing number of similarities or parallels between Genesis 22 and the details of the crucifixion some 2,000 years later. Let me mention just a few of them. First of all, the wood on their shoulders. In verse 6, Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders. And this foreshadows Jesus bearing his cross. Then there's the mountain. And it turns out it's not just any mountain. Isaac carried the wood up Mount Moriah. It was apparently in the wilderness in their day. But scholars believe this was the very same mountain upon which Jesus carried the cross and on which he died. Interesting. Then there's the idea of a substitute sacrifice. In verse 7, when Isaac asks where the lamb is for the sacrifice, Abraham replies, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. And I read that from the New International Version because the emphasis that God will provide it himself isn't quite as obvious in the New Living Translation, although I love the New Living Translation. I think it's an awesome translation. We can't know exactly what was in Abraham's mind as he said this. God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. But his answer was true on two levels. After the angel interrupted him, Abraham looked up and discovered a ram caught in the thicket nearby. So it says in verse 13, he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. And of course, centuries later, God himself provided a substitute who died in our place, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Then there's this idea of being obedient to death. It's, it's not stated explicitly here, but it appears that Isaac was ready to go along with his father's plan. He was almost certainly a teenager by this time, and in any event, he was strong enough to carry a pile of wood up a mountain on his back. So he could have easily prevented his elderly father from tying him up onto the altar had he chosen to do so. And there's no indication that he did. And we know from Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane that he preferred to not go to the cross, but he willingly submitted to his father's plan. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Then there's this idea of the return after three days. These events foreshadow Jesus returning from the dead on the third day. The elapsed time since Abraham had received the instructions to offer up Isaac was three days. During that time, Isaac was, in a sense, already dead to him. As we saw in Hebrews eleven nineteen, 19, just a moment ago, in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. There are a lot more of these parallels and foreshadowings. Just here's a quick bonus one. Note that the head of Isaac's substitute sacrifice, the ram, was caught in a thicket. A thicket is what? A thorn bush. Jesus, our substitute sacrifice, was forced to wear a crown of thorns on his head. Interesting stuff. As I mentioned, this horrible command to sacrifice his son and the events leading up to the stay of execution 
are presented as a test. In the Bible, we often find God leading his people through difficult circumstances as he works in their lives. And I pulled together in very quick, it didn't take me very much time at all, I pulled together a sample of passages from Scripture where God tested people, individuals and groups. And I would have loved to have shared that with you this morning, but we really don't have time for that. Uh, I do have it as a Word document. If you're interested, give me your email afterwards and I can send it to you. I'd be happy to share that with you. And again, it's just a sample. This kind of thing, God testing people, happens a lot. Now, tests in the Bible were often intended to purify the people undergoing those tests. Uh, You know, God perceives that there's something standing in the way of our relationship with him, and he wants to clear that away so that we are relating to him more directly. It's not surprising that God would ask us to give up things in order to follow him. We sort of expect that he wants us to give up sinful behaviors, after all, But sometimes he calls us to give up good things as well. Pastor Keith mentioned a couple of weeks ago that he was a high school teacher, he was uh, enjoying his work, and then he began to sense that God was calling him to go back to school, to seminary, to train, to become a pastor. So he gave up a job and a career in which he was already established. Being a teacher wasn't a bad thing. Lord knows we always need teachers. But in the context of what God wanted to do in and through him, it just wasn't the best thing. In general, testing from God is intended to draw us closer to him, to increase our awareness of our dependence on him. And that has certainly been true for our family as we have pursued God's leading into Bible translation and uh, various steps along the way. There have been a lot of tests. Our very first summer of linguistics courses, we were at the UW, when we were just checking the whole thing out, and our funding plan for the summer imploded, and we did not know how we would pay for those classes. But God provided. And I'd love to tell you that story sometime, so invite me out for coffee or a donut or something, and I'll tell you that story. It's a good story. So then we continued our training, or we could go to Applebee's or the Ram or anywhere. And it's, it, it doesn't have to be. Or we could go out for Thai. It doesn't have to be. Called. Anyway, so we continued our training in Dallas for a year. And in that situation, we struggled with living in one dorm room with two little boys who took turns being sick, resulting in one or the other of us frequently missing class to take care of them. And Truth be told, more often than not, the one of us who missed class was Jeanette. But we finally finished. And then we moved to Eugene, where I was going to do a master's program. And our family suddenly expanded from four to six with the birth of twin daughters. And as a result of that little complication, it took a little bit longer to complete my studies than we had planned. But I finally did. They were very glad to see me go. We depended on the Lord to bring us through all of these tests, and we continue to depend on him, and we are very thankful that he did, and he does. It seems that the point of the test here in Genesis 22 was to find out whether or not Abraham truly fears God. That's strange, because it sounds like God doesn't know what's going on in Abraham's mind and heart. Is that really true? Doesn't he already know our thoughts? I suspect most of us pretty much assume that he does. And I think we have grounds for that conclusion. I want to read you very quickly just, again, a small sample of scriptures that would support the idea that God knows our thoughts. The first two are from Jeremiah. The first one the Lord is speaking, the second one someone is speaking to the Lord. the Lord. The Lord says, I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. And then we read this one. O Lord of heaven's armies, you test those who are righteous and you examine the deepest thoughts and secrets. Then there's a famous passage from Psalm 139. O Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You know what I am going to say even before I say it. And then another famous passage from Hebrews 
chapter 4 about the Word of God. For the Word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. So, if Scripture says that God knows the thoughts and intentions of our hearts, why then, after Isaac's sacrifice is called off, do we read in verse 12, the voice of God, now I know that you truly fear God. Didn't he know this beforehand? Questions, questions. Aren't you glad that when the message came to Abraham to not harm Isaac, it didn't go straight to voicemail? (laughs) Abraham had been following and listening to God for maybe 40 years when this took place. So when the voice came from heaven to stop, in verse 11, granting the wonderful reprieve, It was a familiar voice. It was the same voice that had called him in chapter 12 to leave his home in Ur. It was the same voice that had told him in chapter 13 to walk the length and breadth of the land because it would be his. It was the same voice that had promised him in chapter 15 descendants more numerous than the stars of the sky. It was the same voice that had promised Sarah in chapter 17 that she would be the mother of their son. It was the same voice that had so patiently conversed with him in chapter 18 about the pending judgment of Sodom. It was the same voice that had told him in chapter 21 to send Hagar and Ishmael away because Isaac was the son through whom all the blessings would flow. And it was the same voice that had told him earlier in this chapter to sacrifice Isaac as a burnt offering on the mountain. All of which leads me to the conclusion that if we take seriously God's inclination to test his children, and if we anticipate that some of the tests may be very challenging, it's really important for us to be able to recognize his voice before crunch time comes. As we conclude our All In With Abraham series, It occurs to me that all in is an expression from the game of poker. Now, I'm not a gambler. Neither my sheltered upbringing nor my conservative temperament incline me toward taking chances. And I haven't played poker for anything more valuable than plastic chips since I was in high school. And poker is all about betting and bluffing. And as it turns out, I looked up a little bit on the internet, the rules of betting in poker are actually a lot more complicated than I ever realized. I guess when I have played poker, maybe I was playing the dumbed-down version. Anyway, as I understand it, if a player wants to continue to have a chance to win a particular hand in poker, but doesn't have enough money or chips to stay in, he or she can go all in. Now, you see this in the movies sometimes, if you watch the same movies that I do, and it's always very dramatic when this happens. The the person who wants to make the bet pushes all of his money, chips or whatever, plus whatever other valuables he or she may be risking, maybe the keys to a sports car or the the, uh, fancy jewelry or the title to a mansion. They push all of that stuff to the center of the table. They go all in. It's all being put at risk. For our purposes... The point of this sermon series has been that Abraham held nothing back. Now, I am not implying that God, that following God is a gamble. Please hear that. I am not implying that following God is a gamble. But it can and certainly often does involve risk. Just as Abraham took risks in following God, the Lord will often ask us to do risky things as well. In fact, he may be nudging you today to love someone who has rejected you. Or he may be nudging you to forgive someone who has wronged you. Or to serve someone who has never helped you. Or to remain silent 
and absorb an unjust accusation. These days, we usually try to avoid saying anything in church that sounds like a command. We want this to be a welcoming place where people feel comfortable to come with their questions and their brokenness and be received and accepted. And that's great. We want that to be true. But if in the process of making this a welcoming place, we end up making it sound like approaching God is something we can do on our own terms when and how and if we feel like it, we're not doing anyone any favors. He is the Lord of the universe, after all, and he calls the shots. So I want to ask you, what in your life are you holding on to so tightly that if God wanted to place something else into your hands, there would be no room for it? Let me read that again. What in your life are you holding on to so tightly that if God wanted to place something else into your hands, there would be no room for it? Would you be willing to lay down your pride and be the first one to say you're sorry? Would you be willing to lay down your child, allowing him or her the freedom to find God in his or her own way, even if that meant following God and serving him in some distant land? Yikes, that one kind of strikes close to home for me. Would you be willing to lay down your reputation, taking a public stand for your faith in Jesus? Would you be willing to lay down your future, giving up your dreams and your goals to follow him? God wants us to love him with everything we are and have. He doesn't want us to hold anything back. He will still love us if we do hold back, but we will miss out on experiencing all that he has for us. In James 4, 8, we read that if he wants to draw us to draw close, and if we draw close to him, he will draw close to us. Now, I have to say, it really complicates things, but God isn't particularly interested in relating to us as a casual acquaintance, like someone we nod to or smile at on the street. God, we, we, have, we may have casual friends, but God doesn't have casual friends. Turns out he's very jealous of our affections. He wants first place in our hearts and our lives. And you know what? He deserves first place. We already belong to him because he created us, but he also bought us back from sin and death. He redeemed us at the terrible cost of the death of his son on the cross. We can't be somewhat interested in God like I might be somewhat interested in whatever ball game is on TV this afternoon. It's just not possible. Someone has observed that many of us spend our lives lingering on the edges of a really vital relationship with God. We intuitively know that we need to be nearby, so maybe we come to church, but we don't really believe God wants us to come close. We're afraid to find out just what will happen to us if we take God at his word and act on his commands and promises. Sadly, this fear of what might happen can keep us just outside the intimate inner circle where God may be truly known. We come close enough to see his shadow, as it were, but we never really gaze on his face. We never see the twinkle in his eye as he looks with tenderness and affection on us, his beloved children. In C.S. Lewis's classic book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the four Pevensey children find themselves whisked out of World War II England and into a very strange country, the magical land of Narnia, where animals can talk. The children are being hunted by agents of the frightful white witch, but their new friends, Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, assure them things will turn out right. You see, Aslan, 
the son of the emperor beyond the sea, Aslan, the Christ figure in this alternate world of Narnia, has returned to the land. Lucy, the youngest of the four kids, the younger sister, is very surprised and a little worried when she learns that Aslan is a lion. And so she asks if he is quite safe. Mr. Beaver is incredulous at the question. He replies, safe? Don't you hear what I'm saying? Who said anything about safe? Of course he's not safe. But he's good. And as we close this morning, I want to suggest that going all in with God is a lot like that. It may very well not be safe, especially if by safe we expect a life of comfort and convenience. But God is good. And if our path takes us through fiery trials or deep water, he will be there. He's told us, I will never leave you or forsake you. And I think that may very well be my favorite promise in this book of promises. He will never leave us. I want to encourage you to go all in with God. Don't hold anything back. Set your sights on walking ever more closely to him. It could be risky, but it's worth it. Consider it very carefully and then come on along. And whatever you may need along the way, Yahweh Yireh is still true. The Lord will provide. Amen.